Elite, the classic, the original first launched on the BBC Micro in 1984 and appearing on many other systems soon after. I don't think I'll get many arguments that this was a work of genius, an absolutely groundbreaking game that eventually went on to make appearances on pretty much all the popular home computers of the day. But when it comes to 8-bit systems, undoubtedly the best version was the NES. And it's not just me that says that, the guy who coded most of those versions, Ian Bell, says that too. It was great in every way and brilliantly cleverly done, because the NES is not really well suited for this type of game. In fact, you might even call this the NES's impossible port. But before I get to that, a quick word from today's sponsor, PCBWay. Yes, the one and the only, your one-stop shop for PCB manufacture, 3D printing, CNC machining, injection moulding, assembly, all kinds of stuff. If you're a fan of classic gaming, you'll know that messing around with the original hardware is tons of fun, and PCB Way has your back here with a whole load of ready-to-go retro projects shared on its website. Like this build-it-yourself cart reader, which may come in handy if rumoured beta versions of NES Elite ever come to light. And you'll be surprised at just how inexpensive it is to get going with custom PCBs. Prices start from just $5, and with a $5 coupon for all new users, you might find your first project costs you next to nothing. Anyway, thank you PCB Way. Hit up that link in the description if you'd like to know more. Okay, we're back, so Elite. On the NES, why is it so good and why is it so surprising to see it running on this console? Well, for a start, as I've already established, Elite pretty much anywhere is amazing. A fantastic space trading adventure crammed into very low spec game systems. Dumping the player into a procedurally generated 3D universe, the mission is both dead simple and yet endlessly complex. Fight and trade your way through the galaxies, buy stuff, sell stuff, complete secret missions and attain elite status. Yes, it's an open-ended, open-world game, a massively overused term these days, but it really was a pioneer of that sort of thing. NES Elite has a few things that set it apart from versions on other 8-bit systems. It's got more content, but most of all it's just more friendly and more accessible. It has a tutorial mission to start you out with, which will at least get you used to controlling the ship in 3D space, and the battery backed up save on the cartridge makes things much easier than messing around with tapes or discs on other systems. It's also got a much more intuitive user interface. It's still not that intuitive, but more so than the home computer versions. It's icon based rather than obscure keyboard shortcut based, it really had to be, to be controllable with a control pad, and I would say that it is much better for it. Even with this though, Elite on the NES is still a pretty difficult game to get into, and quite far away from the hugely accessible games that made this console famous. I'm glad it appeared here though, because somehow it does work, but well, it isn't your usual NES game, is it? Yes, this is a strange fit for this system, but it's not just that the gameplay is a bit out there, even compared to more complex JRPGs. No, there's more to it than that. You see, the NES is thoroughly and totally unsuited to this type of game, given its architecture, and getting it to work took a lot of clever programming. But first of all, let's start off with the one thing that the NES really does have going for it, and that's its CPU, a 6502 running at 1.66 MHz, a touch slower but very close to the CPU that powered the original version of this game on the BBC Micro. It does have the processing power needed, just about, but that's pretty much all it's got. The NES is amazing at certain types of games, but not this one. First off, let's talk about tiles, as in T-I-L-E, just to dispel any confusion. Yes, the NES is a tile-based system. It's based around blocks of ready-made graphics like these here. You could also call them characters. These are the tiles or characters that make up all the graphics in Super Mario Bros. The whole game. By default, the NES stores 512 of these tiles in their own separate section of the game cartridge called Character ROM. 
Now this is a little odd compared to pretty much every other game system from this era. Many also used tails, but storing them separately on the cartridge is an unusual quirk of the NES's architecture. Unfortunately, it also makes a game like Elite completely impossible. Why? Well, you can't construct the 3D graphics in this game with ready-made tiles. It's never going to work. 512 graphics tiles is not anywhere near enough to draw every possible angle, every possible configuration of lines that you're going to get in a game like this. The solution? Well, replace the character ROM with character RAM. Yes, instead of a set of predefined tiles stored in ROM, Elite on the NES has an extra 8 kilobytes of rewritable RAM in the cartridge. This makes the NES much more like other game systems, nearly all of which used RAM to store their graphics data in. With this RAM in the cartridge, the NES doesn't have to rely on predefined shapes, predefined characters. It can now effectively draw its own tiles as it needs them and create any arbitrary shapes required. This extra RAM is not that unusual with NES cartridges. Loads of games have enhancement chips built into them to increase the system's capabilities. The Bard's Tale here uses the exact same setup as Elite, and so did quite a few others. This helps to make the game possible, but it's not the really clever part. There are still several serious problems that hamper this game on the NES, all of which took some impressive coding to deal with, so let's look at them in detail. Problem number one, there's not enough tiles. If we take a close look at the viewing window that shows the 3D graphics, we'll find that it's made up from 600 tiles. That's an issue, as the NES can usually only display 512 unique tiles in total on the screen at any given time. That's not enough, and we've not even gotten to the rest of the screen elements like the user interface. Let's take a look into the graphics memory as the game is running, and we can see the bit where the tiles for the 3D graphics are stored. It looks like there's 192 of them, or thereabouts. Not enough to fill the whole viewing window, but enough to draw what needs to be drawn. The viewing window is never going to be completely full of 3D graphics, there's always going to be some empty space. We just need enough tiles to fill in what is there. This is clever solution number one. The game saves memory and saves time by just drawing enough tiles to get the job done. The other stuff in the viewing window, the stars and what have you, they're just sprites made up of just one or two tiles repeated all over the screen. Problem number two, actually drawing all this 3D stuff. And that's such a big thing about Elite, that's what made it stand out, the very smooth, for the time, 3D graphics. How does a system like the NES handle it? Well, I've got to admit that I don't fully understand how it all works, but it's probably a safe bet that NES Elite's drawing is very similar to the original BBC version. If that is the case, then this is quite well documented, and basically the graphics are based around vertices or points in space. The ships and other objects are stored as a collection of these points, and an algorithm determines which of these are visible on the screen when an object is in view, and then plots them in the right place. Another algorithm then fills in the lines automatically, giving the full object on the screen. A lot of time is saved here with many clever hacks. A big one is hidden surface removal. Only the surfaces facing the camera are drawn, reducing the work that has to be done. This is a clever solution at number two, a very efficient 3D engine that fits in the available space and runs fast enough to be playable with this system's 8-bit CPU. All these graphics are created in a buffer in the system's work RAM before being copied to the video memory to be displayed on the screen. This leads us on to problem number three, copying stuff into the video RAM. For the NES to be able to display the graphics, the data needs to be in the video memory in the right format, and getting it there is quite a slow process. For most NES games, this isn't a big deal. They don't really need to copy that much data into this memory for each frame, allowing them to be able to run at the full 50 or 60 frames per second. Most games only have to worry about the layout and movement of predefined elements, but Elite has to deal with all the new tiles that have to be drawn every frame. These all need to be copied into the extra video RAM in the cartridge, and no matter what, the NES can only do this quite slowly. 
You can only move graphics data around in the very short space of time between frames being displayed on the screen. You can't move data into the video memory when the video chip is actively drawing stuff. This is clever solution number three, a very efficient setup that deals with drawing the graphics and getting the data into the right place, which Elite does admirably. The thing is, it actually takes three or four frames worth of time to move all the graphics data necessary for one frame to be displayed, which leads us on to problem four. We need a buffer. When you're drawing graphics on a video display, it's no good just updating the picture in dribs and drabs. It's got to be all or nothing. If in Elite the graphics were put on the screen as soon as they were ready, well, you'd have part of the screen updated one frame, part of the screen updated the next one, maybe a pause, then some more stuff appearing. Running at full speed, it would look terrible. You'd never get a complete frame of animation at one time, it would be a mess. I've altered the code a bit to show you what this might look like. What I've done probably exaggerates the effect, but it gives you the idea. To make the graphics look okay, you need a buffer. A place where you can construct the frame in full before revealing it all at once. The trouble is, there's not enough space in the NES's video memory to do that. We're using it all just to display what we've got, so what can you do? This is a clever solution number four, and this is really clever, invisible ink. You see, whilst the NES is displaying the current frame of gameplay animation on the screen, the next frame to be shown is being laid down invisibly in the same black as the background. This sketch uses a white outline to show you what's being drawn, but on the NES the drawing is totally invisible. When the next frame is complete, the colour palette is changed, the old frame data is set back to the same colour as the background, and the next frame's graphics are set to that blue colour and they suddenly appear like magic. If I change the colour palette with a bit of hacking, you can now see both lots of graphics at the same time, one in grey, one in green. The green colour being the buffer of graphics being constructed, now revealed. It looks even more messed up because many of the tiles are also repositioned as well as redrawn. This only works in monochrome, you can't have more than two colours, and it relies on the way the NES happens to store its graphics data to work effectively without overwriting what's already on the screen. There are many other computers and consoles where you could never get this trick to work, but it will on the NES. Of course, there's more going on here than this. I'm simplifying a bit, a lot, but I hope this gives you a flavour of what is happening with this game. Anyone who really knows the NES architecture will tell you that getting this working so well is just amazing. And it's not just adequate, it's probably the most polished and accessible of all the 8-bit versions. Yeah, enormous credit to the programmers. I keep talking about Ian Bell here, but there's also David Brabant as well, Elite's other creator. I don't know who exactly did what, but Ian Bell often gets the credit for NES Elite as he talks about it on his website. This game never left PAL territories, and unlike many other PAL exclusives, this game won't work on a real NTSC console, and there doesn't seem to be any other version publicly available that will. This is, I'm afraid, the result of trying to run this game in NTSC mode, but there is reputedly an undone prototype of a real working NTSC version, but the only evidence of it is some very shaky footage on YouTube. Is it real? Is it the full game? Well, I don't know, but porting Elite to NTSC consoles could have been very difficult because of some subtle but significant differences in the way the systems work. In short, PAL consoles can copy way more graphics data per frame. Could this have been the final straw for NTSC machines? Is this why it never made it to the USA? Could this really be the impossible port? Well, I don't know, but I think there are plenty of non-technical business reasons why this never saw the light of day in the USA. It was already a bit of a stretch, even in the UK, where Elite was a much better known name. Anyway, that's enough of this for now. I will leave it there and say thank you so much, as ever, to my very generous patrons. 
If you too would like to join them, there is a link below, that would be amazing. If you do have the actual version of Elite that works on NTSC machines, well, do let me know, but at the one that actually works on real hardware, I know there is a version that Ian Bell put out on his website that purportedly works in NTSC consoles, but it, it only works in inaccurate emulators. Anyway, that's, let's leave that there. I'll say thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.